When I first started teaching, I would lose so much instructional time simply because I didn't know how to quickly and effectively start my class. But over the years, I have created a rhythm in my classroom that has allowed me to start every single class like a boss. And in today's video, I wanna show you exactly how we start class in our classroom every single day. And before I jump into this, what does it mean to start class like a boss? I'm not talking about being an overlord or a dictator or like lording over all of your children like they are your royal subjects and have to listen and do every single thing that you say because you said it. Now, I do think students should be listening to you. However, let me break this down. What we're trying to do is create a class that is focused on student learning. The end, it is a place where kids come to grow into the best version of themselves. And so to do that, we need a classroom that is conducive to learning. So if kids are out of their chairs, they're walking around, they're doing different stuff, they're engaged with one another, things are being thrown, things are being tossed, desks are being knocked over, like things that happen like in real classrooms are not conducive to learning especially when even like small things can trigger a student that has ADHD, trigger the student that has trauma, trigger a student that just is having a hard time hearing and they can't hear the rest of the class or they can't hear the teacher. These are some of the things that we're trying to address so that we can create a classroom that is conducive as much as possible to create a learning experience and a learning space for all students. And so the first way that I do this is something I've talked about in a lot of videos, and that is I meet every kid at the door. Now, I choose to shake hands with every student that comes into my classroom because it's a sign of respect. And my one rule in my classroom is give respect to get respect. And you can see that I have a whole video on how I do my first day of school that even if you've had your first day is totally worth watching because it's going to walk you through why I make a lot of these decisions. But shaking hands with my students allows me to acknowledge them, right? I want to see them. I want to say something to them. I want to acknowledge them and let students know that they are not invisible, that they're visible and that they matter. It also allows me a quick gauge of my class. So I can see who might be looking down, who's overly excited, who is, it's their birthday because they'll tell you it's their birthday when they're walking into the classroom. It's, it's small thing, clues I'm looking for as to how you are coming into class today so that I know how I can engage with you in class today and who might need a little bit of extra attention, a little bit of extra love, um, or something that those clues are going to put you onto. The next thing that I do is that I have all of my objectives for the day on the board. And so I hope you can see this. We're going to do a close up real quick so you can just make sure that you can see this. But I am wanting to alleviate as many questions as possible from students about what are we doing today? Reynolds, what are we doing today? Reynolds, is that thing due today? Reynolds, are we reading today? Reynolds, are we doing this today? Are we have journals today? Are we doing vocab review today? I want to get all of that stuff out of the way. Now, they'll still ask you, but at least I can just direct them to the board. What I'm trying to do here is build a rhythm where students know to look at the board to see what we're doing each day. I then also have how much time each thing is going to have. So for my journal entry, I know that I have roughly six minutes. Side note, you are not married to these times. If it takes four minutes, if it takes 10 minutes, it is a loose estimation as to the amount of time that this exact part of the class is going to take. So why do we put this up here? For a couple of reasons. One, some of these things might make students incredibly anxious. So if there's a presentation, if, they're, if we're reading aloud, if we're reading a play together, if you're doing something where there's group work, those are things that can make some students incredibly anxious. I want them to know that this is not going to last forever. It's only six minutes. We're only, this is a key word, we're only doing this for 15 minutes. The other thing that it does is it creates a sense of urgency and let students know you do not have the whole period to do this, right? So sometimes you'll give a student an assignment and they'll go, wait, 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 you're collecting it already? I didn't even start because they were doing something else or talking to someone else or checking on their phone or something. You are creating a sense of urgency, letting students know you do not have all the time in the world. You actually only have six minutes, 10 minutes, two minutes to do this particular portion of the assignment in class. So I build this out. I have my loose times 
on every single thing. I do not have to be super detailed in this. It gives kids a snapshot. No one's coming in and reading this anyway, right? They're not reading anything like in detail anyway. They get a loose idea and then we move on. As opposed to, right, so in Philly and in Jersey, we were required to write our objectives based on the core curriculum standards for on, on the board, right? So in New Jersey, I had to write the NJSLSA dot R1 and then write what the state says is the objective in long form for every objective. Now, should you, the teacher, know the objective for the day? Yes. And this is my own opinion. Should that be connected to your lesson plan, connected to your curriculum? Yes. Do we have to write this out every day? I think this is a foolish idea. No kid ever came in and was like, well, reading closely to, to determine what the text says explicitly and make logical inferences and relevant. I couldn't even write the rest of this because it was boring me already, right? What I want to do is give kids a snapshot and I can tell kids stuff and, and I can make the connection because I want them to know why we're doing this, but I want to make connect this objective to their real life. So I'm marrying the two together. So I do not do this. Even when I'm told to do it in class, I act like a child and I don't do it. I'm not telling anyone else to do that. I'm not telling you to get in trouble. You make your own decisions. You're an adult. So the, after we, we go through this, um, I have, st or while kids are coming in, the bell has rung. I'm handing papers out in my class. And I do things in a way that I realize that not everyone can get away with. If a student is not sitting in a seat when the bell rings or within like two seconds of the bell ringing, then you are marked as late for my class. It's a rhythm that I've built in. My students know that I don't play. They know that if you're not, and I'll do this to be mean, I'm trying to help kids to get in a seat and create urgency. I do not want to stand in front of the classroom and ask six different, Kyle, can you sit, Kyle, can you sit down, Aaron? Aaron, please stop doing that. Aaron, can you please just sit down? If you're not in your seat, you're marked as, oh, Aaron, are you late right now? No, my bad, Reynolds. And then they sit right down, right? And I mark kids as late. And if their parents have an issue with it, I take up with the parents. But that's me. If you can't do that, one of my recommendations is I also do not hand out assignments in my classroom. I have students whose job it is to simply hand out assignments and students who collect assignments. It is my belief that if someone else can do something, then I am not doing it because I have enough other stuff to do, right? So as students are handing out assignments, I'm checking in with kids, I'm taking attendance, I'm making sure everyone understands the question, what's being asked in the journal entry, but I'm not walking up and down the aisles. I wanna be the center of attention when I'm giving directions, right? So students are handing out papers. If a child is not seated, they do not get a paper. And I'm gonna talk about why that's an issue in a second. So they, um, so at, so we're going through this. Students are handing out the papers. All right, y'all, listen, I need everyone's attention, right? In five, four, three, two, thank you very much. All right, the journal entry today, can someone read the journal entry for me today? I have someone read it aloud, right? I then have someone read it a second time. I then go, all right, let me break this down for you, what I mean here, just in case you're lost in the sauce. Or if you don't have something that immediately fits what I'm asking for here, right? I then break it down in another way. Leaders are repeaters. A lot of teachers get upset. And I know that I used to do this when, and I still do. I mean, like, like, I'm like, I, this doesn't bother me anymore. But when a kid asks a question and you got to keep, then it's like, dude, I just said it four times. I just said it four times. I said it four times. I don't understand. How come you don't understand that? Because people process differently because things like ADHD are real because they are paying attention to something else, or they were looking for a pen or a pencil in their book bag. And so that's why when I ask kids to put their attention on me, I will call you out if I do not have your attention. And I will say, Aaron, stop looking for a pen for a second. Yo, I need you all to look at me for just 10 seconds so I can explain this. How long do I need your attention for? And then they yell back 10 seconds. All right, 10 seconds on me. And then I'll help you with anything that you have. You can't find a pen, pencil, piece of paper. You're not really sure what's going on. I'll answer all those questions in just a second. I need 10 seconds. And then run down my directions and I explain it. Because sometimes directions are far better when, or the prompt for your journal or whatever it is, when I just summarize it, when I say it a little bit of a different way, oh, 
Now I got you, Reynolds. Then class is silent while we're doing this. The other thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to put a timer on the board, right? I don't use a timer that has, sometimes I use a timer that has music, but I don't use anything that has super flashy lights or is like, sometimes it has like, there's like ones on YouTube that look like a, like a, piece of dynamite or something and there's like a fuse and it's wiring all the way around I think that creates anxiety in students and I don't want a big explosion at the end I just want it to stop I use a lot of ones that have like jellyfish on them and stuff like that if anything's moving at all simple timer again not to create anxiety in students but to create a sense of urgency to create a sense of knowing how much longer we have now back to the kid that doesn't have a paper yet because they were not sitting in a seat this is a way that I get students to sit down because then they don't have an assignment, which means the timer is going on. You only have, when you get that paper, as much time as is left. I'm not doing this to like, and look, I'll, I'll get comments about this anyway, but it doesn't matter. The, for those of you that see where I'm going with this, it's not about holding back work from a kid. It's about students understanding the order of operations in class that when you come in, I need you to be seated. That when you're seated, you will get an assignment. That when you get that assignment is to be completed and you only have the amount of time that you have. It helps you to govern yourself to understand the outcomes if you're not doing this. Do not give extra time if a student is not finished when the timer goes off, unless you have it in your IEP, unless I saw that it took you a long time to kind of think of what your answer was gonna be, Unless I saw you feverishly writing and you're like, oh, this is such a good idea. Like, I really want to see what he's going to say. Or, or like, I really want to get this answer down. It takes you extra time. That's different. But what we're talking about is helping students govern themselves, helping students to, to have the discipline to come in and to get to work, right? Because we only have limited time, right? And we're trying to do awesome stuff here today. I'm not trying to like drag you through the mud on some whack-ass assignment. I'm trying to do something cool. So after all of this is done, um, and the timer goes off, I then collect the journals, but I don't collect journals, right? I have somebody else, usually two people that are collecting them, right? And they know that they're going to take them whether you're done or not, right? Use good judgment in this. If there's a kid that's really being obstinate and doesn't want to get their paper, I'm not trying to get kids in a fight. I'll go over and take that paper if necessary, but I'm trying to expedite the situation by me being able to jump into answering these, these journal entries um, and without like me having to walk around and collect papers and stuff like that. The next thing that, that may be in front of the last one, but we're going to share in my class, we're sharing journal entries, right? I have a whole nother video on why we do journal entries every single day. And I talk about it in a lot of my workshops and stuff. So I'm not going to go into it here, but whatever your kind of pre-class do now bell ringer sort of thing is, I am covering these, right? So I will allow certain students to share what it is that they wrote down. Sometimes I want them to keep the paper for this. Sometimes I want to collect the paper and I have them just paraphrase it, right? But a lot of times I want them to read exactly what they wrote because I don't want them to tell a long story that they only wrote two sentences for, right? So when, how long do, do I let this go on? I let it go on until I feel the energy shift in my classroom, right? You can notice that kids start getting bored, they get start getting wiggly, someone wants to go to the bathroom, someone starts screwing around in the back of the room. You're looking for that thing. So some days, this time of talking, right? This time of going over discussing journals is a minute. Sometimes it's two minutes. Sometimes journal entries are super short and it's like, would you, because we have would you rather Wednesdays, would you rather have pancakes or waffles, like which is the best, right? It's crazy, it's a huge, a huge argument every year. Um, sometimes it will go longer because you'll really hit into something that's actually gonna draw you into your lesson. It's a total teachable moment. So you're gonna let it roll out a little bit. But once you feel that shift, here's what you're gonna do. Cause there are kids that are gonna still want to share an answer if you have something like, like a journal entry. When that shift happens, all right, I see I have four more people I want to share. Here's what we're going to do. I need to get through what I need to get through. We're going to save your stuff for the end of class because it's going to be like the swan song. It's a grand finale of the day. And that's how I get kids to not get bummed out that they didn't get picked. And it's how I move on to the next thing. Um, there is, and so 
that is when I can do this and then I can transition into my next lesson, my next piece of my lesson, which for us would then be your vocab review. It is a way where kids are coming in. They know exactly what we're doing this day. Everyone's been seen. Everyone's been interacted with, right? Because you never know, right? You might be the first kid that's that you might be the first person that a child interacted with today. So that's part of standing at the door and saying hello to everyone. I have delegated responsibility to students. I've gotten kids uh, writing and speaking within the first 10 minutes of class. And we are now transitioning into the next piece of class, which in this example is the, the vocab review. I'm going to do a whole nother video on how I do transitions in the class because whew, the greatest amount of time lost for educators is in transitions. It's beginning of the class transition, transit that end class part of the class and the transitions between activities where teachers lose tons of time. And if you get that back, you can almost double your educational time in class, your instructional time in class. Before you go, I would encourage you to hit the link below and go into the how I run my first day of class video. And please do me a favor, if you're watching this, just hit the like button because it just helps this video to get out to more people. It's the only thing I ask. Well, besides you could subscribe and all that stuff too, but you know, that's it. But that's it for today, gang. Peace.